Hello, my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline podcast from the Byline Times. The Byline Times is what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, how serious is Russia about peace in Ukraine and what price would the Ukrainian people be willing to pay to end the invasion of their sovereign territory? President Putin has suggested during a trip to Belarus that he is willing to negotiate, but it's highly unlikely that he would do so without being granted significant territorial gains. Ukraine is separately planning a peace summit with its allies in June and has invited President Xi of China, one of Russia's key allies, to attend. Let's get more now from Zarina Zabriskie, who's reported on the Ukraine conflict, the invasion by Russia for the Byline Times many times. In the past week, Zarina has been in Lviv, Odessa, Kiev, and has also been to the Bundestag in Germany. Before we talk peace prospects, Zarina, welcome. Great to have you on. Just Give me a sense of what you've seen and what you've heard and where exactly you are now. Right. Oh, well, there is a lot to look at and discuss here, Adrian. Thank you for having me back. And I'm currently in a city called Sumy. It's the 23rd biggest city in Ukraine at 256,000, at least before the war population wise it is very close to the russian border in fact it, it, it is a large part of the border or the front and in some places the distance is only 50 kilometers so not only this area has been under consistent shelling and fire and attacks also by saboteur groups from the Russian military. But just today, President Zelensky said that Russia has amassed a new grouping of military 90 kilometers northwest of Kharkov, which would put it right next to Sumy district where I am, in order to attack there. So it's extremely important to cover that. Unfortunately, it is not being covered. And I am coming from Chernihov, which is another area close to the border, which is confronting the Russian troops consistently, and which is only also, I'm sorry, consistently hasn't been covered by the press. And so I have planned a trip to go to places where journalists don't usually get to to bring you the news that the telly doesn't show and the newspapers don't write about, and here we are. Overall, there is unfortunately the sense that Russia has been making military advances. How is that seen in Ukraine? Well, yes and no. For one thing very important to note that the situation changes hourly if not daily and the latest news is that the ukrainians are actually being able to regain some territories recently lost that is to say that these territories are completely devastated by the battles by the fights by Russian attacks, aerial bombs, missiles. One of them is Vovchansk. It's a town close to Kharkov, in Kharkov Oblast, and I'm heading there next, after Sumy. And there's an ongoing battle there. And just today, we hear that the Ukrainians made some progress. And that is reported by organizations like the Institute of Study of War, not necessarily Ukrainian authorities, because sometimes, you know, there's operational security, there's fog of war, and you don't always know exactly what is happening. But to answer your question on a more human-to-human -human level in terms of feelings, people are alarmed, people are concerned in Ukraine. There's certainly a vast campaign going online, PSYOP, Russians are very good at it. So they are targeting the Ukrainians' morale, undermining the actions of the government, President Zelensky, the new commander-in-chief. And it rubs off in a certain way. 
you know, everybody's human and people are tired. So you can sense changes, sort of like in temperature, you know, it's like weather when it's going suddenly sunny and then raining and when it's just going really crazy. It's not as steady. The morale is not as steady as it used to be with just only hooray, victorious spirit. Now there's there are more doubts, but still going through this cities and towns and villages now, I see that people are not leaving. Most of people are not leaving. They want to stand their grounds. They speak Ukrainian more than they used to, even in places which are historically Russian speaking. You hear more and more Ukrainian speech. There are flags everywhere and nobody Nobody I spoke to is willing to give away territories or have their government negotiate peace negotiations on Putin's terms. Also, it's illegal. There's a law that Zelensky adopted that, that negotiating peace is illegal. So, The city of Kharkiv is both militarily important, strategically important, but also psychologically important. A few months ago, the Russians were repelled from Kharkiv. There have been indications in recent times, though, that Russia is once again close to capturing Kharkiv. It's certainly been launching a, a really intensive onslaught there, capturing villages in the outskirts of Kharkiv. You've been to Kharkiv. What have you seen? Well, this is what Russians want you to think. This is not the reality. Every single military expert I spoke to, and I spoke to many, both Ukrainian and American and European, absolutely everyone agrees that Russia can hardly capture a village. And it takes Russia literally years to capture some villages, leave alone a multi-million I mean, it's a million people city. It's the second biggest city in the country. And in order to capture it, to seize it or encircle it, Russia will have to have way more troops, way more weapons. And the Ukrainian military have been preparing. I've been last year at zero lines. And already then there were trenches and fortifications built I've been into dugouts and I've been to the trenches myself and I filmed there. So since then, there have been more, way more being built. And I'm going to go there in a week. I will also hopefully be able to report you from the ground, but it certainly didn't diminish. And right now, traveling, I've seen more and more fortifications. I've seen them in the South. I've seen them here. So... Uh, no, the risk of Russians capturing Kharkov is minimal. What they are doing is what they do the best. They're terrorizing the population by daily and nightly attacks, by missiles, as uh, 100 uh, rockets, by Iskander's ballistic missiles, by drones, by anything they can actually get their hands on, and killing civilians by dozens almost every day. So to force the civilians uh, leave Kharkov, then of course it will be easier because you have to remember, I have been saying it on air with you and with everybody else so many times, you probably know it by heart now, but the number one goal of the combat propaganda is demoralization of the army and population of the adversary. And they use not just PSYOPs online, but they also use the bombs in their disposal to terrorize civilians. There have been concerns from the Baltic states about Germany's attitude towards Ukraine, the fact that Germany will not let its missiles be used to attack targets within Russia. Germany is obviously and perhaps in light of its own history, understandably concerned at being drawn into a wider conflict with Russia. But from the perspective of the Baltic states and of Poland, who have their own reasons to fear Russia, 
then this is something which is holding back the Ukrainian defense of its own sovereign country. Right. Well, I have some insight here because I've been in Berlin and Bundestag. I was honored to be invited to speak there by the member of parliament. There was a group in the Green Party. One of them visited Mikolaev. They were not allowed to go to Kherson, and they invited me to speak and do a report, a presentation on the situation in Kherson there. And following that, they've invited me to come to Bundestag, which I did. And I had an hour to show them my photographs, to tell them about various aspects of life and survival in Kherson, about the history of this invasion in the South and in Ukraine overall. And then we had a lengthy Q&A session. And I can tell you that there are a number of politicians who are willing to give the weapons, who will be insisting on providing anything from Taurus to anti-raider system. I put together a list. I'm not going to read to you the list, but be sure, uh, stay sure that I send this list to the uh, parties interested and they're going to pass it on and work on that. The list was compiled based on the military experts and people from Kherson requirements and demands, very concrete things. So hopefully that will help. Uh, obviously, it didn't reach the German ch chancellor, Olaf Scholz, yet, because he has just spoken out against Ukraine using weapons provided by Western allies to strike Russia. And he said that he believes there's no reason to expand the area of use of Western weapon. And he was speaking about the clear rules and just what you are mentioning, what is concerning the Baltic states and Poland. He did say at least that it is my position. So let's hope that the politicians who are seeing Ukrainian uh, point of view will be pushing and hopefully they will be winning this uh, argument. There's also NATO Secretary uh, Jens Stoltenberg, who believes that it's uh, time to reconsider the restrictions. And also the U.S. Secretary of State, Blinken, also wants to ensure that Ukraine is allowed to attack Russian territory and Russian air base with the U.S. weapons. And the last I heard today, just a couple of hours before our conversation, that there is a diplomatic effort right now ongoing, and there's a conversation, and they don't have the clarity yet, but they are hopeful that the ban will be lifted and that Ukrainians will be able to strike their um, air bases. That is not to say that they are not doing it yet. They're using drones and explosives because drones are produced by Ukrainians and they don't need anybody's approval for that. But of course, Atacons or say Taurus would be uh, basically any low range, high precision weapons would be way more efficient than drones. Yes. And we've talked about the assault on Kharkiv. President Zelensky speaking from a printing house, which was attack there, a giant print works in Kharkiv, spoke specifically about the threat to these Baltic states, to Estonia, to Lithuania, to Latvia, as well as to Poland. And he suggested that Russia might attempt to test NATO's resolve by attacking one of those countries just to see what NATO might do. Yes, and this threat is becoming more real day by day. Just today, again, there were reports of the Russians moving the maritime, the water border of Russia and Estonia without consulting with Estonia. Before that, there were some playing around with Finland. They are constantly making these signals. And we by now know that Russia is an empire of symbols. They like these nonverbal signs, and they want the West to get their nonverbal signals. Uh, actually, it doesn't happen all the time, but we, we know what it means. They, they're saying, yes, we're getting stronger. We will be expanding. And if you listen to the uh, Russian state-sponsored television channels, they are speaking about it just in this particular, 
particular words. They say, we are going to come to Berlin. We are going to invade these countries. We are going to burn down London and Washington, D.C. Uh, there, there are no secrets there. Mm -hmm. uh, the point you make about Estonia is really interesting. There's a river called the Narva and a city of that name, which separates Russia from Estonia. And Russia has been moving the boys on the river, the boys which signal the border between the two countries. And that's the kind of example, isn't it, whereby they're just seeing, testing out what kind of reaction there might be. Exactly. It's almost childish, you know, if you are allowed to use this kind of terminology applied to countries or empires or dictators, but it's almost like a child who's trying to see and pushing. And unfortunately, our response is not always what it needs to be, say, um, uh, Schultz response, because it signals fear. And we are dealing with mafia state here. And with mafia, you cannot show fear because they will take over. There's just different kind of laws, different kind of rules. And unfortunately, or oh, fortunately for us, our democracies do not play by, by mafia rules. We are diplomatic. We are following laws. There is order. None of this exists for, for Russian. There's this gap in mentality here and it always always bites back we've been through it so many times this is a major concern here in ukraine of course because ukrainians are very very savvy they understand what is happening even you know people who work in at a grocery store know what hybrid war is they understand this because they've been living it for at least 10 years, actually much longer. But unfortunately, in the West, this is still some sort of novelty, almost at the level of an interesting conspiracy theory, which it is definitely not. And it's reality here. President Zelensky is planning a peace summit in Switzerland. He's invited President Xi of China, which, as I mentioned, is a key ally of Russia. He hopes that President Biden will attend as well. What is the value of a peace summit without Russia's attendance? Well, a couple of things to note here. I, I've been kind of concerned finding out that Biden might not appear at the peace summit because he has an important fundraiser to attend in California on the same day. So he will be at G7 gathering before, and they will also handle the war in Ukraine issues, but that's not enough. I'm really hoping there will be a, the right decision taken and Biden shows up at the peace summit. The reason Russia is not there is because you do not invite the mass murderer to the Council of Enforcement staff trying to stop this mass murderer, if I may. And also, we have learned also from United Nations Security Council or other meetings that negotiating with Russia or having Russia participate in these meetings is counterproductive and makes the whole operation absurd, actually. So I, I totally understand why it would be logical to have Russia there. I think what would help is to have a resolution, which then will be given to Russia in a form of ultimatum. That That is just my idea, you know, hopefully somebody is listening and they will use it, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's the plan. We, we are to see what the plan is. I'd be very interested to see what happens. Sure, that's on the 15th and 16th of June. There was a report from Reuters, which quoted a number of Russian sources, suggesting that Russia might be willing to negotiate peace. Putin was asked about that in Belarus and suggested that he would be willing to negotiate peace. But the question marks remain over Putin based on previous peace negotiations as to whether he would be trustworthy. And in any event, he will seek 
to justify the horrendous losses that his own people have suffered, as well as the horrendous losses that have been inflicted upon Ukraine by gaining at least a significant portion of Ukrainian territory. In practice, Zarina, are Ukrainians willing to concede territory in order to end the conflict? Absolutely not. I, I can tell you that with clarity for multiple reasons. One of them is many, 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 the majority of Ukrainians, I would say, have family, have relatives, loved ones in the occupied territories. It's a part of their country. Say, Kherson, where I spent six months prior to this last trip, is split in two by the front line, which is the river there. And pretty much everyone has a mother, a father, a husband, or children, or lover on the other side. And how would you be willing to give away your loved ones to the empire which is erasing the national identity of your loved ones? It's like impossible on so many levels, emotional, physically, it's very hard. Also, there is this escalating concern and it started as a rumor which like <laughs> give me goosebumps and then I hear it more and more and more and it probably is also reality that Russians will mobilize the men from the occupied territories to turn around the army a very strong army of the largest country in Europe against Europe it won't be just Russia then. It will be well-trained fighters who've been in conflict, in combat for 10 years, well-equipped going on the EU. That is a concern, not just for Ukrainians. And of course, Ukrainians do not want to fight for Russia, but we already have those instances in Luhansk and Donetsk, so-called, quote-unquote, People Republic, or actually... Russia occupied territories where, and I've, I've heard it from relatives and from people who have the, the knowledge, you know, inside the knowledge of, of the situation that the mobilized, recruited soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, are being forced under the fear of death with the, the gun in the Russian soldiers' hands to go and fight other Ukrainians. It will be easier for them to fight Europeans. It's a really a scary, scary thought, but it happened before. And this is just two out of 100 number reasons why it's impossible. Also, you mentioned trustworthy. I mean, that, that brings to mind Einstein's definition of insanity, is repeating the same thing again and again and expect different results. Like, well, let, let's be honest with ourselves, at least on byline podcast air. Putin is not to be trusted. Putin is a dictator. He doesn't stand by his word. And he needs this peace as a pause. He needs to regroup. He needs to train, recruit and train more soldiers. And he needs to fortify his army to enlarge this war, to then go on to Europe. And, you know, his goal is really the empire. And that's what we have here. So a peace negotiation is an euphemism. It's, it's not what he's after. So uh, we, we can't listen to anything that the Kremlin is saying, period. Zarina, great to speak to you as always. Thank you so much for your time. And we've said it before, we will say it again. We will not forget the people of Ukraine at Byline and we will continue to hear your dispatches and others from an occupied country. Thank you so much. This has been Adrian Goldberg on the Byline podcast. Before we go, just to remind you that we have some fantastic new podcast offerings. Head over to Byline Audio. Dot com where you can find the wonderful Utter Bollocks with Otto English and John Mitchinson deflating and puncturing some of the myths that surround us, and also Americana with Hardeep Matharu 
and Bonnie Greer. Head over, as I say, to bylineaudio.com and please take out a subscription to the Byline Times that helps to support this podcast. You get a fantastic monthly newspaper which features the best of our online content and content that you can't read anywhere else. Do take out a subscription over at bylinetimes.com. Zarina, thank you. Good luck. Stay safe. We'll speak to you again soon. This has been a We Bring Audio production for Byline Audio and the Byline Times. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.